Uh, some of this stuff may be uh, kind of basic for some of you, but some of it actually, we're going to touch on a few new things, and then I'll kind of cover some uh, new things we've got uh, at the end. And I also I want to apologize for the uh, the PowerPoint thing, but uh, hey, you know that's that's kind of what uh, a lot of us that end up going around doing some of these presentations have to live with. Anyway, I'm assuming on this presentation you all understand what an IP address is. You understand a little bit of basic system administration. I'm also going to make the assumption that when I talk about tools or refer to tools, that you know how to go and find them. I don't know how many emails that I've gotten from people saying, you know, hey, where do I get the so-and-so tool or whatever, okay, I figure everyone probably knows how to use a search engine and whatnot. And they understand a little bit of the basic stuff about the usage of the tools. Uh, the presentation is more from a network point of view. I'll touch on host-based type stuff where it seems appropriate. Uh, but for the most part, we're talking about the, uh, the, the network itself. Um, I think everyone uh, probably, uh, you know, simple now that I got introduced, but uh, the uh, NMRC.org website, I also I have a, a, a nice day job at uh, Bindview uh, who uh, are very, very happy to uh, hire hackers and whatnot, and so I get to do a lot of a lot of what I've been doing is, is so I've had some people say, why haven't you been updating your website? Well, it's because I've been extremely happy working on the Razor team at Bindview. They've been keeping me really busy, and, and so uh, that kind of tends to be where my attention has been focused. Um, as far as the network mapping stuff goes, uh, uh, first thing you need to know is know a little bit about your target. There's uh, uh, different uh, ways you'd go about, uh, now I'm not going to cover actual breaking in techniques. We're just going to be basically talking about kind to, kind of to do some type of uh, stuff ahead of time. Uh, public information where you can get a lot of stuff. We're going to cover uh, some stuff on that. Uh, some techniques on network enumeration. Then we'll get into some mapping. Uh, public information. Obviously, if you wanted to really research your target, you go out and you look at the public records and everything. You find out a lot of interesting things from public records and whatnot. And um, is, I don't, is Edgar still online where you can search it and everything? That was always a, yeah, that's a, I know they talked at one point, I think about turning it off or something, I'd read something about that. But it's, it's a, uh, that's always something I, I always make sure I take a look at. Uh, of course, who is uh, DNS and all the assorted tools that go with probing uh, DNS. Uh, public postings, uh, this is another thing that some people kind of tend to forget, uh, forget about. A lot of times you'll find that people will, on mailing lists and in news groups and other places, will actually post technical questions and in the process they're giving away pieces of their technology, uh, what they have in there. I'm having problems with the so-and-so backup system. Okay, well I know now what kind of backup system it is and I know what operating systems maybe that runs on, that kind of information. Uh, sometimes they get even more detailed than that. They put their, you know, in their SIG files, they've got also their uh, telephone numbers, so now I've got exchanges that I can word dial because I know what their work numbers are and whatnot. So don't forget the, uh, those areas. Um, network enumeration, pretty much the goal that you have of network enumeration, we'll cover that here in a second. I want to get into on that ICMP, uh, there's some, actually some fairly new things with, uh, with the ICMP thanks to a couple of talks I've had around here. And you can pretty much read the rest, I'm not going to stand up here and read slides to you. Um, I do want to talk on ICMP, uh, one thing that's been you know, the, the first thing that everyone would do, they'd do the sweep with, uh, with echo packets and get the responses back, and now I know I had a host up. And so, of course, people started blocking that at the firewall. Another alternative to that would be to sweep with, say, something like uh, timestamp packets or uh, even info request packets, although that's not supported nearly as much. But if they're only blocking echo packets at the firewall, then by sweeping for these different types, then you can go ahead and get... Uh, find out if you've actually got a host up or not. So a lot of people have taken it a step farther. They're blocking a lot more. They're saying, okay, well, I'm only going to allow in something like, uh, um, uh, I'm only going to allow in host reports and reachables. Maybe I'm going to allow in uh, uh, source quench. And that's the only kind of stuff that I'm going to allow to come into my network. Well, another way I can get around that now is if they're allowing the host reports and reachables in, I send in a uh, a forged uh, host report unreachable, um, just one that was uh, unsolicited. 
I use an illegal header length and what will happen is if they've properly implemented ICMP in the IP stack, it'll say I've got an error now. I'm going to go ahead and reply back saying uh, you've got a parameter problem and so then I get an ICMP back and boom, I've actually now uh, determined that that host is now up. And uh, that was actually theory until I had a talk earlier this week and I got the guy's name in the last slide here because I really appreciate learning that information. The other thing, I don't know specifically how much this goes across the various vendors. They all have their, their different ways of, that they do IP and everything. And not everyone implements things the same way, but we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, here in a minute. Uh, scanning. Why scan? Hopefully everyone here already knows why you scan. You're looking for uh, services running and whatnot. Uh, and pretty much everyone's using uh, Nmap. It's become pretty much everyone. It does some of the ping sweeps and stuff. Uh, uh, but uh, some of the other features, uh, the fingerprinting is extremely interesting. That, that helps out a whole lot. Another real interesting thing that I like to use uh, uh, with Nmap, uh, as most of you know that use it, it comes with a uh, uh, comes with a, a libpcap, and so it goes into promiscuous mode during some of the um, some of the scans, which means that if I set it up to where I don't, you can do the decoy thing and say, okay, I'm going to, you know, and then put in your real IP address in there. Depending on how where you're scanning from, you can use the IP. Say your IP address is someone down the hall. And if you're on the same net, you scan, and since you're in promiscuous mode, you still get all the responses back. And they blame the guy down the hall, or they blame the guy, you know, if you've got a cable modem, they blame some other guy that you've uh, managed to pick up. So that's, that's kind of a neat, uh, a neat little uh, feature there, so where you can scan without revealing your, um, your address. Um, TCP fingerprinting. And I think pretty much everyone here probably knows what that is, but for those that don't, send out a flurry of packets with the very various uh, settings. You get a bunch of different responses that come back, and then these can be, uh, the types of responses can pretty much indicate the uh, types of uh, operating systems you're uh, dealing with. Uh, something that uh, I found out uh, fairly recently, because I just started playing a lot with ICMP and uh, TTL, is that... Uh, by sending in certain types of ICMP packets, um, you know, with various uh, things switched in that, you get you fairly unique responses, and they're fairly consistent responses, and you can do somewhat of a uh, OS type fingerprinting just with ICMP. <clears throat> this comes in handy if you're doing that thing where they've, with the uh, host or uh, port unreachable, you can actually then at that point you're going to be able to tell what type of uh, in some cases, what type of OS you actually have sitting on the inside. Um, the uh, additional probes thing here. Uh, the other thing you want to do is scan for possible security devices. And one thing I, I like to talk about is throwaway hosts. Okay, If I'm going to, let's say I'm doing a penetration test of some kind, you know, some of you may be doing them legitimately. Some of you be, may be doing your own freelance penetration testing, but you get the idea. Where you're, you you want to check out and see where those various security devices are, okay? So sometimes you take a, a host that you know is you don't care about that you have ownership of, and you're going to go ahead and send in your packets, and then maybe you're going to try the same thing again, and then see if the you get some type of different response. So what it is, it involves looking for a lack of response due to perhaps some type of security device that's on there. And of course then uh, using some of the uh, anti-sniff technology sweeping for promiscuous devices. The other things that I would do is um, consider some of the uh, odd ICMP things. I mean if you can, this is one way how you would spot honeypots. If you've got something in there that looks like it's some type of somewhat open NT device and it turns out that it's really something else because the ICMP responses you're getting back are kind of indicating that it's uh, a Unix box and that's the, an example of where you've got maybe a, a honey pot or something like that where you can then uh, obviously avoid it or if you want to 
go in and play around and look like an idiot. I guess you could do that to trick them or whatever. But anyway, um, network mapping. This involves basically determining the network layout, trying to figure out exactly where the devices are, where they're attached, who's talking to what, and whatnot. Uh, trace route's a good tool for doing this. Firewalk is probably a little bit better tool. It gets you a little bit better in there. And then some of these other things we've already been talking about, specifically uh, ICMP is what I'm thinking about here. Uh, for doing some type of bypassing the firewall, this is a slide I should have updated last night. I don't know if any of you are at Black Hat, but there's a great presentation on getting past uh, checkpoint firewalls, which is just absolutely, that was wondrous. That was actually great. So forget the slide, just go to that stuff. It's really good stuff. But uh, I mean, there, there are some things where at least where you're trying to probe, because before you launch an attack against something that's on the other side of the firewall, you at least need to try to know what the hell it is you're launching the attack against. So using things like uh, you know, firewalk to determine what services may be running, or an in map as well, just trying to determine what kind of services are running. You get roughly maybe an idea of what you've got there on the inside. Uh, for the most part, we usually only need, as attackers, you only, you're only going to come in on one port for the most part, unless you're doing something really oddball and sophisticated. But, for, you know, for example, most people leave, in, leave open port 25, they leave open port 80, and those are going to be kind of things you're looking for. Uh, state table manipulation, uh, this has to do with the, uh, uh, the FTP thing that came out to where I can, you know, with passive FTP, I'm going to actually put entries into the state table, and now I'm going to have a way in, into there. That kind of was the lead up to what that uh, Black Hat uh, presentation was on uh, on checkpoint. Um, obviously, if a site has intrusion detection, you want to do something to uh, avoid that if that is your um, call or cause. Uh, the, uh, obviously, if there's some way that you can manipulate the data that they're going to detect, because for the most, these are pattern, pattern matching for the most part. The network based ones are pattern matching. So you can go ahead and, and uh, Maybe try and alter that data, but the attack will still work. That'd be a good way to do it. Uh, fragmented packets. I know that a couple of years ago, there was a big thing at Black Hat and a paper that was released that talked about a number of different ways to get past intrusion detection. And one of them was using fragmented packets. Uh, I think the, most of the vendors, up until about maybe six months ago, most of the vendors were still uh, vulnerable to this. I think there's a few more that are just now getting on board and are patching, but you know, that's still a valid uh, valid thing to try. Did ISS, does anyone know if the real secure stuff actually is d handling uh, fragmented packets now? 5.0 supposedly. supposedly. Okay. Vote of confidence there. Supposedly. Great. You know. Now someone else is saying no, it's not. Okay. There we go. So... Use that then. Great. Uh, another way of uh, avoiding intrusion detection, which is uh, something that I saw at my previous employer, was that if there was a lot of false positives, then the system administrators start losing confidence in it and will start distrusting it. Uh, distraction type things are also a real good thing. Hitting the thing with a ton of port scans, and then you launch your little attack thing, and you get in. I mean, you're just basically, there's, they're trying to track down all this other activity, and then you get the, the slip in the one thing uh, that, that I've actually seen. Another one would be to make sure that if you're going to be logged, and this has to do mainly with the, you know, IDS stuff that looks at, um, uh, that scrapes through logs that's looking for various things. If you make your entries into those logs look like normal uh, log type entries, uh, then uh, there's a very good chance that uh, your stuff will go undetected. I, I know that uh, uh, several years ago, well actually it's maybe less than that, maybe a couple of years ago, I know that uh, the Shadow IDS, if you read through the um, if you read through the manual and followed it exactly the way it was written, it said, okay, you're going to have a lot of stuff in your logs. And Shadow does not do stuff in real time. It is actually goes through and uh, looks at logs. So if I'm doing stuff, um, 
uh, as I said, if you're if you see a lot of stuff at the source port of 80, that's all your web traffic. So you may just want to skip and dump everything with the source port of 80. This was basically in the uh, instructions. So then all you had to do is say, okay, my attacks now are all going to be source port 80, and they're not going to catch any of them. And they were wondering why they were having all these .gov and .mil website defacements. And I think that was probably a, uh, a pretty good indication right there of it. Um, Whenever you're getting all these little pieces of data from all these different sources, you need to start pulling all this stuff together. And you got to remember that even the smallest amount of data that you may collect against a target, this can be reused. This could possibly be reused in the future. I do know there's people out there that will scan and scan and scan and scan, and they build up these large databases of uh, various sites with uh, various ports open and stuff. They may not use that stuff for a long time. It's important to uh, realize that whether you're, you know, attacking or defending, that uh, that's very, very important. And a lot of things, like if I have, you know, just one little spot where I can, you know, perhaps get in part way, maybe I've got another spot somewhere else, looking at each one of these uh, various steps. Um, well, I'll go through here, uh, and I've kind of edited a lot of this. I've done some screen depths of just uh, basically what a live site would look like if you want to do some uh, 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 mapping on here. And I'll kind of go through it here real quick. Uh, do a who is against the uh, target company. I think I kind of messed that up the way I've got that typed there. Doing a who is, first thing I want to determine is get their uh, get the uh, servers, uh, their name servers. Um, this a lot of times someone will. It's fairly common for someone to have their ISP as a backup name server. So sometimes, if you're going after a zone dump to pull down all the addresses, it's usually safer to go uh, against the ISP. Uh, however, in this particular case, this is actually a former employer. Uh, I, I, you know, I just went out there. They did not list the ISP. Okay. They had their own stuff, so I went ahead and started poking around and looking at that, uh, doing trace routes to the various boxes. I've got these, I don't know, that yeah, shows up okay. I've got it uh, highlighted there in, uh, in uh, bright or white. It looks like their ISP is Southwestern Bell as uh, it goes in there. Now, I did a trace route using some using the other box just to be sure. My gosh, they've got a second ISP there, which uh, CW.net, which is uh, cable and wireless. Next thing I did was I went out and uh, did a zone dump on them. Uh, since they left that wide open, as you can see, I got back a huge amount of answers on that. So now I've got uh, a ton of stuff. Uh, this is using a tool called IC, ICMP and NUM that I wrote, I started, I tried doing some uh, ping sweeps just with Echo, and they had Echo blocked, so doing ping sweeps with uh, timestamp, I was able to basically enumerate, uh, uh, enumerate a lot of hosts there. Um, one interesting thing is that NT does not respond uh, properly to a lot of these uh, ICMP things, so if you had a segment to yeah, but for the most part, if someone just a default saying if you if you install services, uh, the, the um, for the most part, if you uh, a, a normal installation of NT, if you go through and sweep them with ping, uh, normal echo packets, you get back replies, and then sweep them with uh, with a timestamp. All the ones that don't answer in the timestamp, those are probably 95, 98, and NT boxes. They fixed it in uh, 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 Win2K. Uh, looking over the public systems, what they have in the uh, DMZ, uh, particularly large companies, if they have any kind of e-commerce presence, n don't just look at for www. Also look for www2, and you know uh, I've even seen uh, web dev dot whatever sitting out there in the DMZ. They got to test it, and so it'll be sitting out there. And sometimes this will have uh, a lot more lax uh, security on it, but Looking through and exploring all those public systems, a lot of times will give you uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of good information. 
um, scanning. This is a real, I've got two scans that you can see here. The first one uh, with MMAP is, uh, you know, I did it polite. And as you can see, I got back a lot of answers there. And then down towards the uh, bottom here, here's another run of NMAP where I'm not, uh, I'm, I don't have the uh, polite stuff going. And for the same address, it shows me that uh, no ports are open. Okay, I've got an IDS system now that probably did something. I got something in there that, that went ahead and triggered that. This is an example of where you're doing the scanning and you know, I do this from a box that I don't really care about uh, whether they learn the IP address or not. I want to actually try and trigger the uh, stuff that's uh, out there to secure the network to try to see what it is. Um, here's a scan, and I swear to God, I, I, outside of changing the uh, domain name, I swear to God that was the uh, host name. The host name of the firewall was Firewall. That was a... Uh, the what now? People use yeah, yeah, they use router. You know, for for the, for the router. You know, this, and and that's what it was. So it was pretty pretty difficult to spot. You know, the firewall there. Oh, firewall dot whatever. And uh, uh, actually, to their VPN box was uh, host name was VPN. Okay, <laughs> but uh, for some, I, and I thought, well, it's, you know, maybe I'll find the IDS that way. But I no, they they actually didn't do that. You know. Uh, the reason I use two dash of E's, uh, verbose, verbose. You get more, more stuff back, you know, because otherwise it wouldn't have filled up this screen, you know, so. <laughs> um, if you look there and you see that uh, some of this stuff is in a filtered state, which means that when I scan them, it means that something out there outside, I'm scanning the firewall. Now think about this. I'm scanning the firewall, but for some reason they're doing filtering outside the firewall. And that's, that's really kind of odd. And that right there is just like a red flag that says, you know, they probably had some type of firewall problem. They couldn't figure out how to do something, so they had to just go out there and put some stuff in the router. And, you know, okay, 139, I think we know what that is. Uh, 161, SNMP. Uh, but the uh, real telling one here is the uh, 256, 257, 258. Okay, that's, that right there, that says that's a checkpoint. Okay, that's, that's what that tells me right there. That's a checkpoint. Those are the ports that a checkpoint uh, firewall uses if you're going to do remote management. Uh, on the box, and apparently they didn't know how to turn it off at the firewall. They had to do it on the router outside, so you couldn't manage the firewall from the outside, which is a shame, because that would have possibly simplified a lot of things. But anyway, so here's the um, here's the mapping of the, how this went with this, just to give you an idea. All right, I know who my uh, ISPs are. Okay, cable and wireless in Southwestern Bell. Two very very fine and very secure uh, ISPs. And just slowly I go through there, I determine you know, where the boxes are, who's pointing to what, and it was fairly easy to determine what was in the DMZ and what was not. And I was able to do, just with a little bit of you know, sending the packets in and doing the trace route thing here and there, whatnot, I could tell that in some cases I was getting uh, one extra hop as I went in. And I didn't know the exact layout internally where all this stuff's crossing over. But I started figuring out that uh, they had some level of redundancy. There was kind of a default path for some of this stuff. But in other cases, they, they kind of had a redundant thing here. And I could see why they did it after I started looking a little more, because uh, uh, cable and wireless, uh, uh, whoever the, uh, the big guy was, uh, you know, UUNet or whatever, at that level, uh, they basically had two, th these, these two ISPs went up to two completely different of the larger backbone providers. So they're wanting, they were working on getting, you know, a whole bunch of redundancy going there. And pretty much at that point you start picking off and, and figuring out what boxes you got in there. And then you get to the point where you've uh, actually started uh, uh, getting some real, 
real indication as to what the uh, the various boxes are. And like I said, this is all uh, this is all pretty much live live data. So um, you know, now if I'm going to attack, I've got a I've got a pretty good feel for what I'm going up against in there in the network. Um, something I wanted to talk about as far as I'm going to touch on this attack stuff since it's kind of a, a somewhat new. Hold on here. Send someone to voicemail. Um, there's two types of attacks as far as distributed attacks go. Those are ones that do not require direct observation of the results and those attacks that do require direct observation of the results. Okay, and I'll give you some examples of what I mean by that. Uh, basic model here, we have, and this is commonly found in your uh, uh, distributed denial of service. And that is you have a bunch of agents sitting out on computers that have been compromised, uh, the, the zombies that are sitting out there, and then you have your uh, servers that uh, send all their stuff to the zombies. By the way, I want to say something about the zombie thing because I caught a lot of shit for uh, Zombie Zapper, okay, because of the name that uh, Bindview released. I did not name that product. Marketing named that product because they read zombie somewhere in a, in a trade magazine. I just wanted to point that out while I've got, you know, a group of people like, you know, whose opinion I might actually care about, you know, it's just so. Very scary. I couldn't come up with a better name, so but you know, nonetheless, I didn't name that anyway. So you have your agents out there. They receive the their stuff from the various servers, and there's usually some client that talks to the server that does this. Uh, the, with the distributed denial of service, you don't need to see the results of the. Uh, you need to see the responses back from those packets that you're sending in to keep people from buying a, a book on Amazon for an hour and a half. Uh, this is a little bit more of an advanced uh, type thing. ICMP and them will do this. That's why I forge the, uh, the timestamp request into the target. The timestamp replies come back, and I sniff the replies, and I forge the source address so that as the packets come back by, that I'm actually going to be able to sniff the replies. Okay, now obviously if it's you're forging to address on your same segment, it's a lot easier. Uh, or you'd have to compromise one of those rock-hard secure ISPs like uh, Southwestern Bell uh, to be able to do this kind of stuff. Okay, this is the one that's really fun. This is the one that uh, I really, really, uh, really like. And uh, we'll have to go through this step by step. Okay, I've got my target, and they've got a firewall out in front. Okay, so they're all nice, nice, neat, and secure. Uh, first thing I do is I break into one of those uh, uh, rock solid ISPs. Yeah. Is it just me? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't have hardly anything to drink last night at all. I, uh, oh, okay. There we go. I'm, wow. Okay. Anyway, you compromise one of those uh, uh, upstream ISPs. Now, this upstream host here, I am never going to send a packet from this upstream host in towards that target at all. It's This upstream host is not going to be sending any packets from me. It's not going to show up in any logs over there whatsoever. I want to protect that guy. Okay, he's gold. All right. All right, next thing here. I got my various attack nodes here, and I got my master node controlling them. And... What I want to do here is if I want the attack nodes to do something to the target, and let's say if they're doing some type of uh, uh, probe, they're doing a scan, whatever, okay, I control them with the master node and I send my stuff up there because these attack nodes, what they're going to do, they'll send in their stuff through the firewall. Now, I may be, what I'm doing is, I may be using as far as a source address, I could be using a, uh, a source address that is a trusted partner. Uh, so, you know, of course, in this whole business-to-business -business thing that everyone's doing with, uh, with this whole e-commerce thing, I may have, the target may have, this goes back to that public records, you know, people that they're doing business with, large customers of them, uh, large vendors for them, 
uh, they may have extra rules in the firewall, and I'm pretty sure that uh, especially the administrators in the uh, audience will attest to that, how often they've had to, all right, we'll go ahead and open up blah, blah, blah port for what's their faces because they make us a lot of money or we do a lot of business with it. I know that I've seen it a dozen times. So those are the source addresses that I want to have coming in on these attacks or these various probes. So the replies are flying by. Now, where they're flying by is that upstream host, so I can now sniff the replies. Okay? And then, of course, to kind of complete the picture, put a link in here between the upstream host and the master node. Now, what this allows me to do then is if I'm doing a scan, for example, okay, I could tell the master node, okay, I'm going to send that to these attack nodes, I'm going to do the scan. Uh, replies come back. I get the sniffed replies in this upstream host and then through a covert uh, channel. He communicates back to the master node. This is all done, you know, with, a, you know, encryption and all that. Probably using ICMP to, or something like that to communicate. And so I can also kind of expand upon this and I can say, let's say that I want to do a, something that's going to involve a TCP three-way handshake, for example. So what I can do is I can send from the master node to the attack nodes. The attack nodes go ahead and send in uh, their attacks. Boom. Up, we pick it back up on the sniffers. The reply comes out. I can send that information back to the master node, and I can continue that whole cycle there. And I can actually have a conversation where I'm actually engaging in an attack. And there is nothing in those logs over there whatsoever on the firewall or anything on the target that's going to re reveal my true address. So that's kind of the, uh, uh, the whole idea behind this. Some other things that make this uh, uh, more fun is that as far as the upstream host goes, when he's sending information up here to the master node, he's going to use roughly the same type of technique that I'm using to grab these sniffed replies. Okay, All these replies, they're destined for some place over here. The sniffer that's running here in the upstream host just knows what to pick up. I'm going to do the same thing. I don't send the stuff from the upstream host directly to the master node. I send it to somewhere on his same segment or somewhere past him to where he's going to pick it up sniffing. And it's the same thing I'm going to do for sending from the master node to the attack nodes. I'm not going to send directly to those IP addresses. I'll send to those segments. I'll send somewhere along the way. Um, obviously, that's kind of complex. If you own UUNet, then you're probably this is going to be a lot easier to set up, but that's kind of the kind of the uh, the model, kind of the idea behind all this. Um, and no, I don't have the software written for this. Okay, sorry. <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm sure someone will come up with it. Uh, I had I did a, did a talk at uh, uh, Sands uh, sometime last year, way before the distributed denial service. And I was talking about some of this stuff and on a much smaller scale, and then, boom, you know, I, I get a, uh, an email from someone after all the distributed denial of service stuff from someone that saw the talk at SANS and said, you know, I think they, you know, looked at your presentation, they ripped you off, dude, because they, you know, it's kind of the stuff you're doing, so. Well, probably, I would expect the natural evolution as the stuff moves along, this is going to be, I would think this would be the next, uh, next type thing. Um, free stuff, we're kind of getting towards the end of the presentation here. Uh, the uh, vendor that paid, or my boss, is a, uh, a Bindview, since they're the vendor that's uh, supplying some software, and I'm wearing their shirt, and they paid my plane ticket out here. You know, I should at least go ahead and plug plug the product I work on during the day. Uh, uh, the uh, SANS came out with a list of the top ten. Um, uh, security things that you all need to check for. I think all it was is just a list. So attackers now had a list. So, oh, I'll just try these first. But uh, you know, you know, they've got the list here, and Hacker Shield has what they call a rapid fire update. Hacker Shield is a uh, is a uh, security scanner. Has an update, an all inclusive update. You can download Hacker Shield for free off the net and load in this thing, and it's good for 30 days. And I think it's like a 25 IP addresses and whatnot. Uh, Vlad the Scanner is what the Bindview Razor team put together. It's a security scanner that only does the SANS top 10. Okay, so it is somewhat limited, 
but it is freeware. It's open source. You can get it out off the Razor website. It has some pretty cool stuff in it. Uh, one of the things it has in it, uh, it has a pretty, pretty nice and neat uh, CGI uh, scanner. Uh, it doesn't do any of the evasion stuff that Whisker does. And until I talked to RFP, I thought that we were doing more checks than he was, but no, it's 1.4 that's uh, either just come out or will be out there very soon is going to have probably 10 times as many, which, you know, bummer. I'll have to snarf more stuff from him to get this up to speed. But uh, that's a pretty cool thing that's in there. The other thing that's in there is uh, we're calling it kind of a protocol scanner, and it's to test the uh, user IDs and, and passwords, you know, so if they have weak user IDs and passwords. And Vlad does Telnet, our login, POP3, IMAP, what else does it do? I'm missing a couple here. Uh, oh, SMB, um, Todd, where are you? Help me, I can't remember. Oh, SSH, I think it's it. There's like six or seven of them that it does. The, um, uh, the SSH one is kind of cool because uh, I don't think there's very many you know, like dictionary style things that you can use to go ahead and go after uh, uh, SSH. Uh, just, you know, saying user IDs and passwords and whatnot and have the thing actually automated. We don't have a huge amount of uh, default accounts and uh, password passwords listed in the supplied databases, but obviously you could all supply your own. Uh, and the final thing, which is a kind of a fun tool, is called uh, dspoof. And if I'm getting scanned or I'm getting a packet coming in and I'm thinking, hey, is this thing really, you know, a, a forged packet or is it the real thing or not, it'd be a kind of a, there should be kind of a good way to kind of tell. And what this does, dspoof actually checks the uh, TTL. It sends a packet out and tries to determine the real TTL from where I received the packet from. So obviously, you know, I can say, okay, I got the, the packet I suspect is forged. Let's say it has a TTL in it of, say, 50. Okay, now I'm going to check that and test it by sending a query packet out to that address. And I get a response back, and I look at that TTL. If they match, then it's probably the real thing. If not, then maybe the thing is forged, especially if it's way off. So that's kind of a way that you can check. It's kind of a fun thing that you can do with the with that uh, TTL. Anyway, the things, these tools just got put up there on the Razor website and I encourage you to all go out there and download them and have some fun with them. Um, be careful with uh, Vlad the Scanner if you're the kind of person that just likes to point it at whatever, okay, the uh, protocol scanner thing is actually going to be considered intrusion into a system. You're trying users user IDs and passwords, but uh, pretty much everything else is just you're looking to see if a file is there, or if a service is running or something. Um, I wanted to say thanks to a, a couple of people here. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce uh, Ofen Arkin's name. I hope I just pronounced it correctly. Uh, some of the ICMP stuff I've been discussing uh, up until uh, Friday when I got, got over here to DEF CON was theory. And he's already been doing a whole lot of research on on that. So a lot of the theory stuff, he was able to pull something out of his backpack and says, no, dude, I've already checked this out. And here's some more information on it. So look for dspoof to get updated with uh, even more exciting stuff. And then uh, Donald McLaughlin was the uh, one that put me on the path about uh, the whole tricks, all the tricks with uh, uh, TTL and whatnot. And uh, so he deserves... Uh, some credit on that as well. I want to make sure that I mentioned those guys' names. And uh, as far as follow-up goes, uh, obviously the NMRC website, and I promise I'm going to start updating the thing a little bit better than I have been. I know that I've been bad about that. Uh, but also look out on the Razor website. Half of what I've been working on usually ends up out there. Anyway, and probably some of the things that we work on on Razor that aren't exactly politically correct to be stuck out on um, on the Razor website will probably end up on the NMRC website. So that's kind of a thing to know. And then I got my email addresses there. Uh, that's pretty much it. If we've got some questions, feel free to fire away. Yes.
Okay. Uh, the comment was about uh, wanting some comments on uh, how some people will modify their kernels or modify whatever so that when you're getting an NMAP scan uh, that's trying to do a fingerprint, uh, maybe it's doing something, you know, maybe it's saying, oh, I'm not really this OS, I'm actually a printer or um, something else like that. Yeah, I mean, that's where I think this ICMP stuff that uh, Ofen has come up with uh, is going to be pretty interesting. And matter of fact, one of the things I'm going to get when I get back home is uh, probably to work on a scanner of some type that actually uses ICMP to do fingerprinting. That's that's what I mean as far as like as far as spotting a honeypot. Uh, if you've got something that shows up on uh, uh, Nmap is one thing, but then you look at some uh, some of the responses coming back from ICMP, and it just says this is a completely different IP stack. That maybe I've got something uh, funky happening there. Any other questions? Okay, I guess not. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming and visiting my website. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you and blessed be.